Okay, everyone, welcome. Thank you for being here. And for those who are trickling in, this will be recorded. So obviously you can pick up from, you know, where you get in today and watch this again. We encourage it. So as the, Jeff did mention, we did an entire body system examination from the start of this year up until last month where, you know, very symbolically, I got to round it out at the headquarters in Minnesota. It was awesome. And this master philosophy thing that we're going to start to introduce today really kind of came out of an organic um, summary, which was meant to describe the approach for the entire product line as it related to our, I believe it was a seven, eight month long examination. So this really did become the happiest of accidents for the company because the company's name is just absolutely perfect to leverage. I'm going to use master absolutely everything that I possibly can when it comes to terminology and pigeonholing various things that reflect how the company's philosophy does approach clinical practice. So the whole guide to the master philosophy, which we're going to introduce today, is really what I call a systems approach to understanding how the full scope of the master supplements and U.S. enzymes product portfolio can be considered and clinically applied for a specific health condition or just understanding how to keep someone healthy in general. Because once you've got someone out of the woods, how do you keep them you know, on the straight and narrow? So the why of why I created the master philosophy comes from the whole philosophy of a comprehensive approach to supporting clinical care. Each individual person requires a unique touch. I wish this weren't the case. I wish there was kind of like a paint by numbers approach to health, but there really isn't. And when it comes to addressing the client, functional medicine is very much open to interpretation as is allopathic medicine, naturopathic medicine, osteopathy, what, ha what have you. So we wanted to give people an idea of where to start when it comes to our product line, but also the rationale and the reasoning behind how we came to that conclusion. Because the entire product portfolio for this company is rather unique. We do things a little bit differently from other people. So we're gonna introduce a way of integrating the entire product portfolio. So for the clinicians who are maybe using five or six products and they just haven't necessarily delved into some of the other products because they don't understand where they would fit or don't understand the mechanisms of action, this is why I created a this than that approach when it comes to education and action, because the best education in the world sometimes makes you sound really smart at a dinner party, but when the rubber meets the road and the client's in front of you, what is it you do? And my whole approach in this to kind of summarize the why is it's really about the process, not the protocol. Protocols are great, and in some cases they work very well, but I want to give people, you know, aces up their sleeves or something in their back pocket, whatever metaphor properly aligns or fits when the protocol doesn't work. How do we think through the problem so we understand not only the symptoms being manifested, but possibly the root cause via the physiology and where the dysfunction is being presented? So this right here is the master plan, the master philosophy. It's understanding that we need to create a foundation first. And because we are a digestive wellness company, that is our bread and butter right there. We're focusing on products today that are bolded and focusing on digestion and how to address digestion um, artfully. And then each month subsequently, until we get to the end, we're gonna go through addressing dysbiosis, which very, very closely ties to digestion, then understanding systemic support, which is a general way of addressing immune activation, oxidative stress, detoxification and things that stem from that. And also then understanding what I call systemic specificity, where you're looking at focused and targeted products, given what a client might be dealing with or presenting. So it does start with digestion and you guys all know I don't take myself too seriously. Today, Jeff reminded me of a quote that I dropped that I totally forgot. And that's every time you eat is an opportunity for something to be poorly digested. And I say this to a lot of my own clients. I say, the best diet in the world poorly digested is probably worse for you in the long run than the worst diet in the world completely digested. Understanding that the digestive system is still the outside of the body and it's the final layer between what circulates around our body because remember it's tissues and cells are basically comprising all of our organs. And uh, a smart guy, you might have heard of him, his name was Hippocrates, he did say that all disease begins in the gut and I do believe although it's probably an overgeneralization or possibly a simplification, 
if you look at the rise of things like autoimmunity, chronic degeneration, allergies, neurological disorders, research is showing that all of these have some sort of causal link or origin within dysfunctional digestion. An example would be that in Parkinson's disease, there's a protein that is easily discovered about five to 10 years in the gut called the alpha-synuclein protein prior to the onset of the manifestation of Parkinson's. So it just goes to show you that even though you might not be focusing on the digestive system because you're a specialist, being more of an inclusive generalist will give you a greater opportunity for patient outcome. To get into the meat and potatoes today, we have to do a quick review. So this is gonna be very breezed through and this is why I put these graphics up here because the slides will be sent out. You can go through these in your own time. So we have to understand within the, in the digestive system, each organ has its own very specific role and they're all very much choreographed. If you think of a, an orchestra, all the instruments have to be able to play not only in tune, but in proper sequence. So everything from the salivary glands to the colon must be interlinked and all of the secretions of the specific organs and glands must be properly timed in order to facilitate the digestive process completely. And understand those secretions we're talking about today are specifically enzymes. So each enzyme has its targeted action or its targeted molecule. Amylases are for carbohydrates, proteases are for proteins, lipases are for fats. And it's really important to understand that in the process, different kinds and different quantities of enzymes are secreted in different places. And if you bypass a specific part of the process because of an underfunctioning organ or a methodology of how you're eating, not only do you compromise that process, you compromise everything downstream because each link in the chain must be very much secured. We also have to go a layer deeper to understand that each enzyme has its ideal conditions. So specific enzymes in the saliva operate at a very specific pH. And if that pH is improper or potentially excessive or deficient, then those enzymes become inactivated and that digestive process doesn't facilitate itself. Same thing with the stomach, same thing with the small intestine. So knowing these basis under, uh, helps you to better understand what products are being efficacious and what part of the system and what decisions you can make based upon potentially what your client's presenting. And then when all of these variables come together, you know the organ or the gland, you know the specific enzyme, you know its function, and you know the prior and the preceding step, then you properly understand digestion, and then you can put all of these things together and take that to specific places and targeted locations and potentially distinguish clients who might need HCL more rather than clients who might need a fat digesting enzyme or an enzyme that has a complement of all the macronutrients when you digest. We're not going to go over this diagram, but I absolutely love that someone's brain put this together. I'm very visual in how I see things come together, so I always encourage uh, diving a little bit deeper into understanding that this digestive diagram pretty much tells you everything you need to know. And when you can start teaching this to people in a very basic way, you do increase client compliance. And I have to say, because of all the body system examination we went through, we do have to understand that it is a holistic approach. What I mean by that is if you are trying to treat your client's digestion and it's not moving to the degree you think it would be, there's other aspects up the chain that you do have to understand, specifically the autonomic nervous system, the tone of the vagus nerve, and its role in stimulating the cephalic phase of digestion all the way to the release of waste material because it should be one seamless process in and out. So do not neglect the holistic perspective as we dive into a very deep focus with digestion today. So we have to start with the purpose of digestion. And it's a really simple thing. You're breaking large molecules into small molecules and there's two processes at play. There's a mechanical process, which is chewing, and there's a chemical process, basically, which is everything else besides chewing. And the goal of digestion is to allow these small molecules, and we'll get into just how small later, to safely pass through the absorption process so your body can take in all the good nutrition from your diet, transport these molecules to the specific sites of need of the body so they can be metabolized for the synthesis of energy, the creation of ATP, or the creation of new molecules, specifically proteins, lipids, things like muscle tissue, enzymes in the body, cell membranes, what have you. So 
our digestive process is really what keeps us alive because it's what brings the energy that the earth gives us into our bodies to sustain our life and vitality. Anything that compromises that, well, that's a pretty self-explanatory process at this point. So when we understand the greater degrees of digestion, understand that mechanical grinding is chewing, chemical breakdown is when you're mixing all the different secretions, the fluids of the saliva containing enzymes, the hydrochloric acid coming from the stomach, the enzymes and specifically the bicarbonate coming from the pancreas and the bile coming from the gallbladder, they all have to basically be secreted at the specific site of large molecule breakdown, principally starting with the stomach. They get into the small intestine, which is the site of medium molecule breakdown. And finally, the epithelial barrier or the brush border is the site of small molecule breakdown. And when it comes to absorption, everything from there is either getting directly into the bloodstream specifically carbohydrates and proteins, and then into the lymphatic system when we're talking about fatty acids. And this is the first time that I want to introduce the product portfolio to introduce the concept of where they fit in. So when we're talking about complete protein breakdown, we're talking about stomach support, that's always HCO. When we're talking about full macronutrient support, we're talking about Digestime and Digestime Plus. And we're talking about fat-focused digestion, specifically focusing on small intestine and bile secretion support. We're talking about enzylase. So understanding the categorization of all these products is really going to help you as we get through the rest of the presentation to understand where you're going to want to plug something in. And if you do have questions towards the end of how to use these products, I'd really like to discuss some of that in a Q&A format. So most people think digestion begins when you swallow food. Not the case. Digestion does not even begin when you chew food. Digestion begins in what's called the cephalic phase. It's the senses. Think about this. Walking into a room, you're smelling what someone's cooking. It smells incredible. You can smell it. Your mouth starts to water. You can see the food. Your body starts to prepare itself for nutrition and nourishment. This is really the beginning phase of digestion. And, di and chewing is what initiates the digestive process. Chewing is really about facilitating two major actions. Chewing increases surface area. So this allows for two things to happen. It, it allows for the natural enzymes within foods to be liberated and activated. So if you're eating a raw food, nature packages enzymes within those foods to assist its own digestion and breakdown. But it also releases salivary amylase and salivary lipase, which begins mixing with food, providing we chew properly, because no amount of digestive supplementation will overcome the fact that someone chews six times and simply swallows. If there's one takeaway from today besides how to use supplements properly, if you simply teach your clients the benefits of mindful eating, proper chewing, eating in a relaxed state and not eating uh, distracted by watching something on their phone or eating in a rush or God forbid eating while driving a car, this alone will make a major change in the ability for the body to properly digest, break down, and absorb the food that they're eating. Once we've got through proper chewing, hopefully, the next step of the process is entering into the stomach, which I call large molecule breakdown and protein hydrolysis, because the main purpose of stomach action in the process of digestion is for protein and peptide degradation. So imagine large molecules of proteins being unfolded and the activation of the hydrochloric acid and the protein digesting enzymes in the stomach initiating the next step of breakdown for proper protein digestion. So as food enters the stomach, the release of a very specific hormone called gastrin is secreted, which stimulates the parietal cells of the stomach to release HCL, hydrochloric acid, and pepsinogen. The main purpose of HCL is to denature large proteins and it also activates the pepsinogen, which converts itself into pepsin, which starts breaking proteins down even further. There's a lot of research out there regarding what the ideal pH range is, and it's actually quite interesting because a strong stomach with food in it will achieve a pH of approximately three. HCL that's secreted by the stomach will actually be secreted at a pH of 1.8, in a proper uh, functioning scenario, but the combination of the HCL mixing with the food will bring the pH up to about three. And what this does is a few things. It helps to further facilitate proper protein breakdown. It helps to neutralize potential pathogens that may come in on food. And it stimulates something what's called the acid trigger, which 
prepares the next series of organs in the digestive process for basically the job they have to do. And an interesting thing about low pH range within the stomach is that endogenous enzymes that you supplement or endogenous enzymes that are lying in food do not get neutralized fully and completely by stomach acid. Instead, they lie dormant until the pH range rises to the optimal settings or the optimal ranges for them to facilitate their action in the process of complete protein, carbohydrate, and fat breakdown. So if you suspect your client is dealing with something from a stomach perspective, and if you're looking at it from a symptom perspective, things that are upper GI in nature, heartburn, reflux, a lot of burping, and a lot of upper torso distension, HCL is where I go and if your clients are people who are on a higher protein diet, it's even more important to consider this. Reason being is a lack of low pH within stomach acid compromises protein breakdown. I always say protein that does not digest ferments and protein that is not being properly acted upon by pepsin cannot be acted upon by the enzymes that are being secreted, not only by the pancreas, but also further down, <clears throat> further downstream. Um, neutralizing pathogens, because any pathogen that can basically hitch a ride into your system on food can cause a severe reaction, something like that of food poisoning. So the neutralization of foodborne pathogens is something that's absolutely essential, given the fact that pH, the pH of HCL needs to be low enough to take care of any passengers that may hitch a ride on the food that you're eating. If anyone's ever gone down to Mexico and drink the water or had any kind of fresh food that unfortunately put them in bed for the next three days, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And when someone's st stomach is dealing with a scenario of hypochloridria, you want to slowly help stimulate the regeneration of that. That's going to happen when the body and the stomach specifically has enough energy to stimulate the proper release of HCL via the parietal cells. So you can also look at HCL as a gap bridge to facilitate supporting that process until the body can find its optimal state once again. Personally, I find so much success in using HCL Zyme with all of my athletes. I work with a lot of pro athletes who are on rather high protein diets. And in their scenario, protein not digested is protein that's not being utilized to support recovery from not only training, but from the intense gameplay that they deal with on a regular basis. So once we move from the stomach, we're getting into the small intestine. Here's where the pancreas and the gallbladder come in. If the stomach was the site of large molecule breakdown, the small intestine, specifically the entry point to the small intestine is the site of medium molecule breakdown. So from here, we're thinking proteins going to peptides. We're thinking polysaccharides going to disaccharides. And we're thinking of triglycerides going to fatty acids. And this process is mediated by the release of two major hormones, secretin and CCK, which is cholecystokinin. And if you remember from our lecture about three months ago, there is an enteric nervous system that basically conducts and controls traffic to allow the proper processes to be facilitated in the small and large intestine after food has come out of the stomach. Understanding this, we need to know that once food leaves the stomach, it's actually considered what's called chyme, and it's a very acidic bias. It's coming out of the stomach at approximately a pH of three. To neutralize this food and protect the fragile you know, tissue and cells of the small intestine, the pancreas is going to release bicarbonate to properly neutralize the chyme, and the pancreas is also going to mix enzymes, which are waiting for that elevated pH to start mixing with the exposed surface area of the food to start chopping up these medium-sized food molecules to prepare for the last step of absorption. The bile from the gallbladder is also essential because it's there to essentially improperly emulsify fat. And if fat does not get emulsified properly, it starts to run through you, oh, like that of a Japanese bullet train. And if anyone ever suffers from something called steatosis, that's when fat is not being properly digested and your stool floats at the top and there's usually an oily slick or an oily layer on top of the water. So the pH range of the food leaving the stomach has to be about three. Once it enters the duodenum, it rises to about six. That's when the initial process of the mixing of the amylase, the proteases, and the lipases take hold. As it moves through, it rises up to about 7.5 as it ends the ileum. And then the pH drops down to about 5.7 as it hits the ileocecal valve because the colon is typically an anaerobic acidic environment 
because that's when the fermentation process is a fibers happen. So your microbiome can actually start creating what are called postbiotics, things like short chain fatty acids and urolithins, which have a very different and specific function. When we're understanding pancreatic secretions and brush border secretions, the main focus is that carbohydrate and protein digestion is happening in both places, whereas fat digestion is happening specifically at the pancreas because there's a very different digestion and absorption process there. The pancreas secretes pancreatic amylase to focus on carbohydrate digestion, pancreatic lipase to focus on fat digestion, and trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and a nightmare to spell and a nightmare to pronounce, carboxyl polypeptidase, which are all focusing on protein digestion. Once it's gone down to the brush border, a lot of these enzymes do return on the protein side, but from a carbohydrate perspective, you're looking at small molecule digestion. So things like maltase, sucrase, and lactase are all focusing on taking those polysaccharides, those long starch chains, and creating them into disaccharides and single sugar molecules for the absorption process. So from a functional perspective, the pancreatic amylase is splitting large starch polymers into smaller starch polymers. Pancreatic lipase is deconstructing triglycerides into what are called free fatty acids and glycerol, only to have them reconstructed again. And the protein digesting enzymes are taking large protein molecules and chopping them up into small peptides. The brush border uses the exact same process in terms of its pattern, but in this case, you're going from small peptides of proteins down to dye tripeptides and amino acids for the absorption process. And from a carbohydrate perspective, you're looking at small polysaccharides into simple sugars to be absorbed and utilized. So this is where our product line from a, an enzyme perspective comes in. Understanding the differences of what it is you need to do with your clients or what your clients are presenting is quite simple here. There is no absolute science, but if your clients are suffering from issues with fat digestion or they're wanting to follow something more like that of a paleo, a ketogenic, or a higher fat diet, then enzylase is the way to go because of two reasons. One, it's got a much higher dose of lipase in it, and it also has the process of deep delivery, which allows the sodium alginate in the capsule to bypass the harsh conditions of the stomach so it gets into the small intestine and acts upon that food when the pH range has been realized and optimized. Digestime and Digestime Plus are more of a wide cast net. What I mean by that is they don't necessarily have a preference towards carbohydrate, protein, or fat digestion, but they have an incredible wide swath of various enzymes that operate across all specific pH ranges to support the optimal breakdown, digestion, and absorption of those large macronutrient molecules that I mentioned, so that when they get to the brush border, the brush border enzymes can act upon the final phase and facilitate the proper aspects of digestion that do not stimulate irritation to the epithelial lining, which can generate issues with leaky gut. And when it comes to enzymes, it's so important to have three major consider considerations in mind. First and foremost, it's heat range. Enzymes have an ideal operating window of about 92 to 104 Fahrenheit, which is body temperature. And when you're cooking your food, it's typically always higher than this. And this is why cooking food inactivates and denatures enzymes. And in the case of healthy people, it still in my mind justifies that if someone's eating a lot of cooked food and they're not going for a lot of raw things like salads, fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, taking a digestive enzyme with larger meals is a good insurance policy. The other thing is a pH range. All of our products are very much focused from plant extracts. So the pH has a wide range of operation from about three to nine. If you're using something more like that of pancreatin, it's a much narrower operating range. So plant enzymes do offer a greater coverage and insurance policy to support all aspects of digestion, even when someone's secretions are not optimized. And the third thing is moisture requirements. Most enzymes use the properties of hydrolysis to catalyze their reactions. So it's an essential nature to remind your clients that when they're taking supplements, they need to stay well hydrated. And if they're not properly hydrated, their bodies will be lacking the goblet cell secretions of the mucosal lining, the salivary secretions, and the necessary hydration for these enzymes to be maximally effective. So when understanding Digestime and Digestime Plus versus Enzylase, you can see that we've separated categorically the three major macronutrients and the various protein, carbohydrate, and digesting enzymes that cover the wide range of pHs. So we're trying to focus on supporting pancreatic secretions, 
helping to facilitate what I call a medium phase of digestion. This is when we're taking medium-sized molecules and preparing them to be chopped up into small molecules prior to absorption. It's going to support and prepare the epithelial layer for digestion, i.e. the brush border. And when we're facilitating complete macronutrient breakdown, we're supporting proper absorption and we're not going to stimulate issues with things like food sensitivities, the development of potential allergies, or the compromisation of the gut barrier that's going to lead to leaky gut. The difference in enzylase, as you can see, and the other ingredients, we have the sodium alginate for that deep delivery aspect, and the lipase quantity is much higher. So I like to use this product in conjunction with potentially some bile support for what I call the gallbladder issue crowd, or if those are on some kind of ketogenic high-fat diet, this is a really good insurance policy to take the burden off their gallbladder and off their pancreas when it comes to the added requirements of the digestive support to properly break down fat. Although we're not going to get into this one too much today, I'm going to give an honorable mention to glutazine, which we'll get into in the phase 1B and uh, phase 2. When it comes to digesting things like gluten and casein, the reason these protein molecules are so allergenic or, you know, predispose people to having a lot of sensitivities is because of how the proteins come together. There's what's called a proline rich chain that the human body just does not make the proper enzymes to properly break down, split and absorb. So trace gluten residues that irritate people can basically be neutralized by taking something like glutazine. This is generally for people who want to minimize their exposure to gluten, who are extremely gluten sensitive or are full blown celiac. Now, this is not something that you can take, go eat a pizza and think you're gonna have a great night and not have any negative consequences. This is something to deal with trace gluten residues, but it also has a very specific effect on the body when taken on an empty stomach to help deal with what are called caseomorphines and gluteomorphines, basically protein byproducts from casein and gluten ingestion that have somewhat of a neuroinflammatory pro property or process within the body. So we're not gonna get into that one too much today, but we'll, we'll cover that next time. So when getting further down into the digestive system, we now have to understand that we've gone through large molecule breakdown in the stomach, medium-sized molecule breakdown after the pancreas and gallbladder. Now we're getting into the aspect of small molecule breakdown and absorption. This is looking at the small intestine, the microvilli, and the brush border. The whole goal of how this structure comes together is to maximize surface area. If you were to take the digestive system, flatten it out, and expose its surface area maximally, it would cover about two tennis courts. So understanding that just goes to show how much importance the body is placed on the process of absorption. And it's important to remember that under each epithelial cell, which have its little microvilli finger-like projections, that's a direct entry point into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. So this is the last layer of the outside of the body. And as we'll come to understand, this process is very fragile. So we want to understand how to maintain this specific structure of tissue while we're supporting digestion. So within brush border activity, we need to understand what actually is happening from a digestive perspective. Most people don't know that there are enzymes contained in the mucosal membrane within the finger-like projections of the microvilli. And for this step to work, all of the above processes, starting from chewing to the stomach to the small intestine, need to be properly facilitated and executed. These enzymes are there to complete the final step or the last aspect of digestion. And if you use an example, if something like maltose, which is a uh, two glucose-linked sugar were to come into the epithelial cell there, maltase, the enzyme, will split that maltose into two units of glucose, so that glucose can be transported through the epithelial bar barrier, getting directly into the bloodstream, which is called paracellular absorption. These epithelial cells are held together with tight junction proteins that are very fragile, and the only things that are actually meant to go directly through the tight junctions, for the most part, are water and very small solutes, things like ions and minerals and that things of that nature. But the brush border is the final step, and you can't supplement brush border enzymes. If someone has issues with their gut, they have a gut irritation, they have some kind of digestive infection, you have to remedy or eradicate the issue that's causing the inflammation to the localized tissue 
while supporting the above digestive process in order for it to be properly facilitated so the tissue can heal and the last step of digestion no longer compromised. The reason it's so important is this is the last thing that prevents unwanted materials and unwanted compounds to get directly into systemic circulation. The human body is meant to absorb monosaccharides, which are single sugars, amino acids, di and tripeptides, which are one, two, and three amino acid units, and fundamentally absorb tri triglycerides, which are packaged into something called chylomicrons that go through the epithelial barrier directly into the lymphatic system. Anything beyond this that gets absorbed is something that's going to stimulate the activation of the immune system, a likely inflammatory response, and a potential sensitization to whatever that molecule, molecule of food that's being absorbed would be. And this is how food sensitivities originate. And every time someone therefore eats something that they've become sensitized to, it stimulates an inflammatory reaction perpetually until the body becomes desensitized, which is usually after a period of elimination, typically three to six months of avoiding that food before it's slowly reintroduced on a rotational basis. So to sum up the essential nature of digestion, we have to understand that completely denatured proteins have to be broken into amino acids. Completely cleaved polysaccharides have to go down to monosaccharide simple sugars, and completely separated triglycerides have to be broken into free fatty acids. And when this is the case, the result is actually an optimal scenario. Adequate digestion yields adequate absorption, you're not going to be dealing with any kind of nutritional deficiencies because the body's going to be able to not only properly ionize vitamins and minerals, it's going to absorb them all together. And there's going to be no post-consumption modification of things in the microbiome. Things like excessive amounts of proteins, amino acids, and undigested sugars getting to the microbiome can stimulate the development of dysbiosis and immune activation. You're not going to have any sensitization to potential food issues, things like sensitivities, or if someone does have allergies, you're not going to exasperate those allergies. And as a result, there's going to be no need for the chronic recruitment of the immune system and peristalsis, i.e. the speed by which all of the contents of your digestive system are moving through the tube is optimized not only for the absorption process, but it's regulated for the waste removal process. We have to understand that the digestive system is designed to be two things, a physical barrier and an absorptive barrier. And it's kind of a conundrum in the sense that it's really good at one absorbing and it's really bad at another when it comes to being a physical barrier. And the only thing that actually regulates the ability of leaky gut not to be developed are these tight junction proteins that are very sensitive to any kind of pro-inflammatory stimuli. And a lot of people don't know that these tight junction proteins are not regulated by our own genes. Rather, it's the interaction between the microbiome, the immune cells, and the epithelial cells that actually stimulate the regeneration of the physical barrier and the tight junction proteins. The good thing is the GI system is the fastest replicating area in the body. Your GI cells replicate themselves every three to five days. So what's good is if there is a GI issue, as a clinician, if you get all these variables right, you can really help to regenerate that person's well-being quite quickly, providing you're supporting all the different inputs to the gut that need to be considered as a result of doing so. Because once it's in, into the gut, it's out of the gut into the body, and it's really here where the principal site of the immune system lies. About 70% of our immune cells circulate here. So you can see it's not only nutrients, but we're talking about all the different microbes and the immune cells that are not only evading and surveilling the mucosal membrane, but also the basal lateral circulation, where you have all the immune cells that are going to direct traffic as soon as something potentially pathogenic or foreign is coming in. And this is likely what's at the root of a lot of people experiencing chronic degenerative diseases or conditions. So the consequences of poor digestion are far beyond just what happens in the GI system. And getting into the next phase that we're going to talk about, the microbiome is always going to be implicated because the modification of the gut microbes is going to influence this process that's called crosstalk. Anytime there's an increased population of potentially pathogenic disease-causing bacteria that suppresses our commensal healthy bacteria, it's going to sensitize the immune system. And the crosstalk between the micro, right, microbes rather, and the immune system is going to be one of hostility. It's not going to be one of symbiosis. So that, in addition to the increased dietary antigen load, i.e. protein sensitivity, and increased microbial postbiotics, 
can be really pro-inflammatory to someone. And this is a scenario of dysbiosis that's going to be chronically degrading the gut barrier. And then you're going to have a systemic response because it's always microbiome dysbiosis, immune activation, systemic response, which basically means contents of the GI system are translocating outside of the gut and getting into systemic circulation. And now we're dealing with a scenario that's called metabolic toxemia, which is a chronic low level of inflammation that is always going to have to be dealt with by the immune system, which is going to take energy away from the body, reduce someone's vitality. And depending on where those molecules settle via systemic circulation, probably develop into some kind of serious organ issue downstream. So the connection to 1B, which is going to be our next aspect of, of focus and expose, is how the development of dysbiosis and leaky gut compromise the overall state of the individual. Understanding that large molecules of proteins cannot pass through plasma membranes, we need to properly break down our proteins in, to ensure that we're not going to develop aspects of leaky gut in the small and large intestine. Understanding that if we're not properly breaking down proteins, specific microbes do have proteolytic enzyme capabilities. That means microbes can feed off of amino acids, overgrow and develop an imbalance and generate further degrees of dysbiosis. If we're not properly digesting our carbohydrates, well, it's not just fibers that are fermentable to microbes. Certain microbes and yeasts love to feed off of simple sugars that are not properly digested in the small intestine that arrive in the colon. You can develop dysbiosis in that manner. And the last thing is, Inadequate bile secretions and inadequate bile uh, modification by microbes can actually cause issues with immune production of specific immune cells that can calm the immune system from a state of inflammation. Th1, Th2 balance gets disrupted, elevations in Th17 cells and a deficiency of T regulatory cells and often connected to things like inefficient secondary bile acid production. So the major point of understanding here is Digestive disruption has to negatively impact all things downstream. So understanding that, we're starting to paint a picture of it all starts with digestion. So as clinicians, the question we have to ask ourselves is the clients in front of us, what do we do? We have to understand that all sick people need to eat. So regardless of what your specialty is, if you focus on helping to treat and address the digestive system, to some degree, every condition is going to get better for a couple of reasons. If it's something that connects to inflammation in the immune system, you're going to reduce the inflammatory burden that may be driving or stimulating the process that is resulting in the development and manifestation of the symptoms or the condition that has been pre-diagnosed. The other thing is when people are not well, what gets them well is the body's own self-healing regenerative processes. So the more someone thoroughly digests their food, the more they thoroughly absorb their nutrition, the body can use those, those nutrient molecules to help regenerate itself. And if you quickly look at this, this graphic here, I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call deals with one of these or multiple of these conditions that does relate to chronic digestive dysfunction. It's things like epithelial barrier dysfunction, immune sensitization, and if we're getting super deep into it, chronic gut brain dysregulation can really cause lots of downstream consequences for, for all of our clients. And as a specialist, most of us learn to operate in silos. And I don't think that there's enough good generalists anymore. So this is where I believe all of us should come together and help and guide. We can learn from each other because health really is a holistic philosophy. Allopathic medicine doesn't have it all figured out. Neither does naturopathic or functional medicine. But the community of health practitioners that are out there, I think, really have to bind together now more than ever with, you know, the, the state of the world and the health status of the average person never being worse than it currently is now. We have to understand that digestion is prior to internal functional disturbances and pathologies. Most people who get diagnosed with a disease 5, 10, 20 years prior to that likely had an issue with compromised digestion because the, the gut, as we have learned through our examination up until this point, connects to everything. So the whole person needs to be considered and treated. And when it comes to where to start with someone, starting with the gut and the digestive system is an easy low hanging fruit because there are no negative consequences to doing so. And in my clinical experience, I found that doing so positively affects everything downstream. So some of the dosing strategies and concepts we can discuss now, but also at the end, 
things that I've experienced personally beneficially with my clients. And that's who says you need to take a supplement on a daily basis or a supplement with every meal? How do you distinguish a daily need from an occasional need? And I want to introduce the call, the, the insurance policy concept in the same way that you rent a car, knowing that you can take it off a jump or throw it in reverse on the highway if you want. Sometimes having digestive supplements on hand, even when you're a healthy person, is just a really nice thing when you're going out to a steakhouse and someone layers onions and mushrooms atop a 12 ounce steak. So looking at the products we discussed today, I came up with a max concept, a minimum concept, and understanding where you might want to start based upon a crossover. So knowing HCL zyme is supporting protein digestion and supporting function of the stomach, the max concept is taking an HCL or possibly two with every meal. Some people like doing the HCL challenge test. Not my favorite thing, is I think there's a lot more going on there than just waiting for the burning to tell you when it's the right amount to take. But if someone's wanted to use the minimum concept, it's taking an HCL with large protein meals, or maybe taking one every so often when they feel that they're overly stressed, they're underslept, or when they're feeling they're eating something that they, that they know they don't react well to. How to distinguish taking Digestime versus Digestime Plus is pretty simple. Digestime Plus is basically a double strength version of Digestime. So if someone is on a higher calorie diet, like a pro athlete, for example, or an incredibly active person, start with Digestime Plus. If someone has a very sensitive digestive system, using Digestime is probably the best place to start. And in some cases, you can start with Digestime Plus and then move down to Digestime if you want to go from the maximum to the minimum concept. Or if you've tried Digestime with a client and it's not strong enough, go up to Digestime Plus because sometimes pill fatigue is a thing. Enzylase, as I mentioned before, is really good for supporting fat digestion. So if your client has no gallbladder, if you suspect they have issues with digesting fats, specifically that they've been telling you they've manifested symptoms, or if they're on a high fat ketogenic paleo style diet, it's a good insurance policy to make sure that you're properly absorbing your fats, because if you don't, you run the risk for developing nutritional deficiencies with fat soluble vitamins.